broadcast on YouTube. I have a few announcements this morning. The first comes from Debbie Prince. Debbie is looking to recruit a few folks who would be interested in serving on the Christian Education Committee or Worship and Music Committee. Each committee will meet only three to four times a year and will help to organize educational events for our congregation and support me in planning for worship. No specialized knowledge is needed to serve, just a desire to support the spiritual life here at St. John. Please reach out to Debbie if you would like more information or are interested in helping out. She is also looking for anyone who may be interested in being a reader during worship we are going to be expanding our list of readers beyond the deacons and would like to develop a list of interested folks. So that announcement comes from Debbie. See her during coffee call if you're interested in any of those three things. We've got two opportunities to study the Bible. Our adult Sunday school meets on Sunday mornings at 930. The sermon club meets at 1030 on Wednesdays. Per capita, we are still collecting, and Charlie's Lenten recital is this Friday at noon, and it features Chelsea Getty on the cello, so come out if you are available at noon and support Charlie in his recital and enjoy the music that he has to offer. Any other announcements this morning? Cora. I think it's 469, 69 says 64, yes. So we'll be collecting names for Easter flowers. Cora doesn't know the price of those flowers yet, so we'll put out a form so that we can gather the memorials or the honorariums, and then um, we will let you know how much those flowers cost when we get a price. Other announcements this morning? Hi, Fran. So that's personal invitation to Charlie's Linton recital. Other announcements? How about joys and concerns? We want to lift up Linda Reed and her family as they mourn the loss of Linda's sister, Sherry. Other joys or concerns? Hi, Betty. Sheila, sorry. Yes. Oh, no. So we pray for Drew's mother who fell and broke a body. Yep. Happy birthday, Luke. Congratulations to Ben for making it to All-State Honor Band. He gets to go to Purdue next weekend. Nice. So Ben made the Honor Band. Congratulations to Ben. Other joys or concerns? Luke? Uh -huh. Okay, so prayers. Dodie? Zoe. So we pray for your neighbor and the arrival of baby Zoe.
other joys or concerns. Hi, Madison. Shoemaker family. Sorry for that loss. Other joys or concerns? Hi, Vicki. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. You too. <laughs> Plenty of prayers for you too. Joys or concerns? All right, we have the opportunity to gather around the table this morning, so it's a special Sunday. Let's begin by inviting Charlie to share his prelude. Good morning. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. When God speaks, all creation answers. When God speaks, lives are changed. Those held hostage by oppression are set free. The voiceless shout the story of salvation. When God speaks, Everything is turned inside out. 
join me in the confession of sin. Even with those simple commandments, eternal love, we manage to get it wrong. We misuse your name on almost a daily basis and dishonor our friends and neighbors by talking behind their backs. We hunger for what others have and think we can put you in a box, storing you away on a shelf. We find little enough time for our families for ourselves, you, much less setting aside an entire day for that rest you call Sabbath. Forgive us abiding love. We think we are so wise with the choices we make, only to end up with all that keeps us from you. Your word has come to fill our speech with grace, with hope, with peace. As we journey to Jerusalem, may we invite others seek to follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. <clears throat> the good news is that God forgives us. Forgive others and forgive yourselves. First reading today comes from Mark 12, verses 1 through 12. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent to them finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, so they left him and went away. Thus ends the first reading. Our second reading continues in Mark chapter 12 with verse 13. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Bring me a Daenerys. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a Daenerys and let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the thing that are the emperor's, 
and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our ears to hear you, open our minds to know you, open our mouths to praise you, open our hearts to love you, and open our lives to serve you. May the word proclaimed today be according to the truth that we find in the gospel of Jesus Christ and according to your holy purposes for this church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> a man put a lot of work into his vineyard. He put a fence around it. He dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. The language is meant to remind us of Isaiah chapter 5, where a similar man does the same thing with his vineyard, puts a fence around it, digs a wine press, and builds a watchtower. The fence was to protect the vineyard from outsiders. The wine press was to bring in the grapes and turn them into wine, of course. And the watchtower was to look for threats. It was a lot of work for a common vineyard. So this vineyard was more than common. It was an extraordinary vineyard, one with a lot of sweat and tears poured into it. The man, of course, in this story is God, who put a lot of sweat and tears into Israel. God invested in them. God created them to be a people God gave them a land. God put a lot of work into creating us. God gave us gifts. God gave us personalities. God gave us character. God gave us blessings. God has given us a place to live in most cases. God has given us families and friends. And God has given us the ability to serve in our community. God goes out of God's way to give us a beautiful life and a beautiful land in which to live. In Isaiah, the man or God returned to the vineyard expecting to find good fruit, but instead all that God found was wild and sour grapes. The lesson of Isaiah is about bearing good fruit in the world. So Israel was the vineyard and were supposed to and was supposed to bear good fruit for God, but instead all they produced was sour grapes. In Mark, though, the man goes to another country and leases the vineyard to tenants. So in today's passage, Israel does not stand in for the vineyard. Israel are tenants who have been given care of the vineyard. The tenants were responsible for caring for the vineyard, producing the harvest and producing the wine. And all they were asked for in return was to give a quarter up to half of what they had produced to the owner when the time came for payment. The owner would have come and expected his share of wine. So the tenants would work the land. They would get to keep much of what they produced. And all they had to do was to give the owner of the vineyard his share. Except these tenants didn't want to pay their due. The tenants, again, represent Israel, who were given responsibility for God's kingdom, who were given responsibility to care for the poor, 
who were given responsibility to take care of the widow and the orphan, who were given the responsibility to execute justice in the land. We are responsible for taking care of what God has given us. We are responsible for taking care of what blessings God has given us. We are responsible for taking care of ourselves, taking care of our neighbors, and taking care of God's kingdom here on earth by caring for the poor, by looking out for the outcast, and by loving our neighbors. And all we are asked to return is to share those blessings. This means tithing a portion of what we have, but it also means using the gifts we've been given in service to others, either through the mission of the church or our own personal mission field. We have the opportunity as being a part of a church to serve in a variety of ways through this organization we refer to as Christ's body. But we also have our own personal mission field in which we live and work. We have the people we come into contact with. We have the people we work with. We have the people we go to school with. And we have a responsibility to our families as well. But again, the tenants didn't want to pay their due. When the time came, the man sent servants to collect his due. But the tenants seized them, beat them, and sent them away empty-handed, and others they killed. The man kept trying. He sent servant after servant, and it was all the same. They were seized. They were beaten and sometimes they were killed. In this story, the servants are the prophets of God, sent to Israel to get them to repent and return to God with all their heart, mind, and strength. The prophets were sent to Israel to give God God's due. But as in the parable, those prophets throughout history were seized, beaten, and even killed. Jezebel killed many of the Lord's prophets in her day, such that Elijah was left as the only one. And he ran for his life because of her threats. Zechariah was killed for confronting Judah for disregarding God's word. Jeremiah was thrown into prison by Zedekiah and then into a muddy cistern. And as we learned a few weeks ago, John the Baptist was beheaded for criticizing King Herod. The tale of the prophets was told in the context of these servants who were rejected, betrayed by the people, seized, put on the run, beaten, and even killed. Prophets were feared because they spoke the truth, and the truth was uncomfortable for them to hear. Prophets were feared because they spoke the truth from God about obedience and judgment. And the people didn't want to obey God's commands, and they didn't want to be judged for their behavior. People didn't want to hear what prophets had to say. They didn't want to repent of their ways, content with their comfortable lives, convenient idols, and corrupt leadership. Don't we do the same thing to people who make us feel uncomfortable? We don't seize or beat or kill people, but we don't like to hear an uncomfortable truth. We don't like to hear that we will be judged for our ways. We don't like to hear that we are wrong. We just want to hear that we're right. We want to live our comfortable lives. We want everything to be easy 
and we want everything for ourselves. But those people who speak the uncomfortable truth to us, we ignore, we resent, or perhaps we do kill them with our thoughts and sometimes our words. We reject God in doing so because we are content with being self-centered, self-indulgent, and are complacent with the way the world is hateful, divisive, proud, and arrogant. We don't want someone to come along and rock the boat like the prophets did. We don't want someone to come along and remind us that we should be caring for the poor, reaching out to the outcast, serving others instead of serving ourselves. We want to be taken care of. We want our lives to be comfortable. We want everything in the world to ourselves. We want to be the center of the world rather than making the common good the center of our lives. Finally, the man sent his beloved son. Having run out of all other options, after seemingly running out of servants to deliver the news, the man sends his beloved son, saying, they will respect my son. But how wrong the man was. This is the heir, they said. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. They might have assumed that the owner of the vineyard had died if the heir was coming to collect the dues. The man didn't go himself. He sent his son. So perhaps these tenants thought the owner had died and that by law, they had the right to ownership of the land on which they worked. So they thought removing the son, even if the man hadn't died, put them in line to inherit the vineyard and keep it all to themselves. That's all they wanted. They didn't want to share with the man what was due to him. They wanted to keep it all to themselves. And we do the same thing. We don't want to share our lives with others. Or if we do, we only want to share it with a select few, certainly not the poor and the outcast and the stranger. The son in this story, of course, is Jesus Christ the beloved Son of God. Jesus didn't often refer to himself as the Son of God. That was an identification that was made for him at his baptism and at his transfiguration. But the story is about the Son of God, sent by God to get the people to repent, to save them from their sins, and to get them to serve God and give God God's due. Like the son in the story, Jesus would be seized, beaten, and crucified outside the walls of the vineyard or Jerusalem by the same people who had rejected the prophets before him. Surely we don't want to believe that we could ever reject Jesus or crucify him ourselves. But what do we say? But what do we say when we just go about doing what we want, saying what we want, taking what we want without heed of his presence or purpose in our lives? What do we say when we have rejected Jesus? like the tenants had rejected the son? What do we say when we just want to keep our lives to ourselves and not give the portion back to God that God is due? It's as if we've rejected his lordship, 
mocked his salvation and crucified him with our faithlessness. Jesus sums up the parable by quoting Psalm 118. And that's an important psalm because it was one of the Passover psalms. And that's why Jesus had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. But the key to this story is that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In relation to architecture, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone laid for a structure, and it usually has a date or some marking on it. And all the other stones are laid on the cornerstone for reference. A cornerstone marks the geographical location by orienting a building in a specific direction. Jesus was the cornerstone. He was the foundation around which the kingdom of God would be built and oriented. His resurrection would be the key to eternal life. Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. He is the foundation on why we are here. And this meal is the foundation of why we gather. For it reminds us of his death and resurrection. Jesus said that it was necessary for him to die so that the sins of the world might be saved. I was doing a wedding yesterday and there was a young boy about 11 years old who came up to me and said, I know something about Jesus. And I go, what is it? And he goes, he died to save us from our sins, and three days later, he rose again. I said, if you need to know anything about Jesus, that's enough. Jesus' death would become the foundation around which the kingdom of God would be built. His resurrection would be the key to eternal life, and both would bring about our salvation from sin and death. So inevitably, inevitably, the son had to go to the vineyard because the son had to die. Because even though they had rejected the prophets before him, the son still loved the tenants. And he says that the vineyard would be destroyed and handed over. The passage continues with something, a teaching that is related to this passage. If the parable of the tenants is summed up in teaching us what we give to God, what we owe to God, then Jesus' teaching on the taxes is the same lesson. Some Pharisees and Herodians wanted to trap him. And after flattering him, they asked him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Of course, we have already met the Pharisees in the Gospel of Mark, but the Herodians are new. They're a political party who align themselves with the Herods and wanted to keep the Herods on the throne. So these two groups, the religious group and the political group, come to trap Jesus in a political and religious quandary. So Jesus, sensing their hypocrisy, the Bible says, asked for a denarius. And he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? Now, we know that the head would have been Caesar's, and the title that the Caesars were given was sons of the gods, the deified one, or the chief priests of Rome. All titles that we would assign to Jesus himself. 
Jesus critiques the cult of the emperor who sat on the throne thinking himself a god. And yet he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. He tells the people to pay their taxes, to be good citizens of Rome. He didn't want to bring undue persecution to the people for not paying their taxes. He didn't want them to be oppressed for not being good citizens of Rome. He wanted them to follow the laws of the land. But he didn't stop there. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. Jesus tells us to follow our civic duties, but not without tending to to our spiritual duties as well. And that is loving God supremely and our neighbors sincerely. Loving God with all of our heart, mind, body, and strength. And loving our neighbors as ourselves, as Jesus loves them. <laughs> so again, the common lesson of these two teachings, the teaching on taxes and the teaching of the tenants was the same lesson. Give to God what is God's. Today, what are you withholding from God? What part of your life are you not giving over to God? What part of your life are you withholding? What service have you not rendered? What love have you not shown? For there is no greater love than to give one's life in service to others. That's what we see at this table. How Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. For he loved all of God's children and didn't want to see them suffer but wanted to save them from sin and death. So in our lives, let us give God what is due. Let us give of our time. Let us give of our treasure. Let us give of our talents. And let us do so by giving what we have to others, by serving the poor and the outcast by welcoming the stranger, by clothing the naked, by feeding the hungry, by giving even just a cup of cold water to one such as these, Jesus says. For when we have done it to the least of these, it is as if we have done it to Jesus himself. So our due is to treat all with respect and dignity and give what we are able to them so that the world might be a place where everyone stands on their feet. Everyone is guaranteed basic rights and everyone knows the love and salvation of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
join me in the affirmation of faith which comes from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Join me in the call to the table. May the God of mountaintops be with you. People of God, love the one who would make your hearts a place of holiness and hope. We open ourselves to God who raises us to new life. God's beloved children, sing to the one who will not let you stumble on your way to salvation. We rejoice. Let us pray. Almighty God, you created us to be your people. You created this world as a vineyard and you gave it over to us tenants. But you had to send prophets to remind the people of the error of their ways. Prophet after prophet came along preaching a message of repentance and return, of justice and of mercy. And yet the people refused to listen to the prophets. They seized them, they beat them, they killed them, they rejected them. And so you sent them into exile, but still you sent prophets there and told them that, like Isaiah, their punishment had been served doublefold and that God would bring them back home. You are a God who brings us back home. When we were lost and wayward and deep in the clutches of sin, you didn't condemn us, you didn't leave us, but instead you sent your Son, your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who came to teach us, to show us how to live, to show us how to care, to die for our sins and be raised to new life so that we might have life eternal, so that when this mortal life is over, we might know that heaven awaits us. And this is all by his doing, not ours. We stand here knowing that this is a feast of grace. For it is by grace that we are saved. We remember here what Christ has done for us. How this is his body broken and his blood shed for us. But how it is also the bread of life and the cup of salvation. For this is not just a remembrance of a gloomy occasion. This is a celebration of the feast to come. And by some great mystery, we join the saints on earth and in heaven, proclaiming the mystery of our faith that Christ has come. Christ Christ is living, Christ has died, and Christ will come again. Jesus Christ invites us to this table today where we are welcomed. We are welcome to bring our failures. We are welcome to bring our brokenness. We come hobbling from sin. We might come hobbling from illness. We might come with a broken heart. We might come with hopes and dreams, but let us come hungry for righteousness and truth. 
Let us come hungry to receive what he has to offer us here. And let us remember that it is because of this feast that we give you our due, that we stand in right standing with you, and that we leave with the confidence of our salvation and set out and do what you would have us to do. Holy Spirit, anoint these gifts of the earth and of the vine and make them the means by which we embrace your grace, your peace, and your hope and your love. We pray this through Christ, who with you in the Holy Spirit reigns in the glory of the power that is love. Amen. In a few weeks, we'll be remembering the story of Monday Thursday and of how Jesus was betrayed and arrested. But before all that, we remember that Christ shared a meal with his disciples. And as part of the meal, he took bread. And after giving thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, This is my body which is given for you. Take, eat, and do this remembering me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup. And after giving thanks for it, he gave it to his disciples saying, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink and do this remembering me. Brothers and sisters, as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim Christ's saving death until he comes. Jesus said, my body is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup will live in me and I will live in them. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Join me in the prayer after the supper. Loving God, you graciously feed us who have received these holy mysteries with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom. For you have made us your own people by the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord, and the life-giving power of your Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, you have created this world in all its beauty. You give us foggy mornings to remind us that sometimes we can't see what lies ahead of us, but we trust that you have a destination for us. Redeeming God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be for us the atoning sacrifice for sin. He is our great high priest, and we can come boldly to you because of his sacrifice, because of his obedience to your will. May it be that that grace is not in vain towards us. May we live each day and make good on it, on account of your love. Sustaining God, you send Holy Spirit to be for us wisdom, inspiration, guidance, and purpose. Give us a sense of purpose in working with Holy Spirit so that we might be sanctified that we might be holy as you are holy. Triune God, we come to you in confidence with our prayers, for we know that you are a God who cares, a multifaceted God that we cannot put in a box, but that comes to us in all the holy mysteries Give us comfort knowing that we do not always understand your ways, but confidence knowing that we can trust your guidance. We pray for this church. We ask that you continue to sustain us, to help us grow, to help us serve our neighbors. Be with the churches of New Albany as together we unite around a common witness and manifest in our, un and in our diversity what it means to be unified under the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be with the churches in the world, especially those in Palestine. Be with the churches in places where they are persecuted and even where they are martyred. We thank you for their faithful witness to God's kingdom and keep us mindful that we are not just part of an American Christianity, but that Christianity is universal and encompasses the whole world, the ends of the earth, as you promised in Holy Scripture. Be with our national leaders. Give them a sense of cooperation and bipartisanship as together they work on legislation 
that benefits the common good and that helps us to be a strong country that shows the world what freedom is, that shows the world how united we are, that shows the world what democracy can do. Be with us during this election season as people go to the polls and give their voice as to those they wish to lead them. Be with those who lead us on the state and local level as well. Be with those who are suffering from cancer and leukemia, kidney disease, liver disease, all the things that can go wrong in our bodies and all the diseases that have no cure. I pray for those families who have a loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia and how hard it is to lose a person even before they die. I pray for the dying. I pray for our hospice workers. I pray for those who are nearing the end of their lives. And I pray that they have the peace I've seen at someone's deathbed as they are surrounded by family, content with how they have lived their lives and hopeful for the promise of heaven that awaits. I pray for our doctors and nurses and first responders. I lift up the Louisville Fire Department today and what they were able to do in that dramatic rescue. I thank you for their training and their devotion to their community. I lift up those who battle addiction, those who treat them, those who love them. I pray for those experiencing sobriety and help them to live each day anew and to the fullest as sober individuals. I pray for our homeless and those that care for them. As the weather warms up, we know that they have no shelter available to them. And so we pray for them as they are on the streets, making do in makeshift camps, in lean-tos, and getting by with the donations that they receive. I pray for those who are on poor economic times, who live from paycheck to paycheck at best. I pray for those who live without a paycheck. I pray for those who face eviction. I pray for the hopeless and the dispossessed. I pray for those who have turned their backs on you and ask that you help us reach out to them and share with them the good news of how much you love them, how much you care for them, how special they truly are because they are your child, because you created them. Give us a sense of the dignity and worth of all people. Help us to fight for justice, to make peace, and to walk humbly with you. Lord, today specifically, I pray for Linda's family as they mourn the loss of her sister, Sheila. I pray for Martha's mother-in-law, Dottie. We thank you for seeing her through the fall, but help her now to heal from her various injuries. Bless Luke on his birthday tomorrow and be with his and Emily's neighbor as they wait the arrival of baby Zoe. We lift up Ben and his accomplishment of our honor of being a part of the honor band. We lift up all of our youth. We thank you for their gifts, some of which they use to serve our church. We pray for the Shoemaker family in the loss of Kylie's dad, 
We lift up Vicki and John, and we ask that you help them with their various ailments and that you bring them healing, grant them patience. I lift up Josh and Ashley and ask that you watch over them as they travel to Gatlinburg after celebrating their marriage yesterday. Lord, these are those we have named. In a time of silence, we bring our joys and concerns to you. For there is much we have not shared that we have kept to ourselves, some of which that we have buried in our hearts. But help us give it over to you. Help us to use this silence to experience your healing, to experience your strength, to receive your courage, and to seek out your guidance as our trust deepens in you. Give us wisdom to know that your answers come in your way and patience knowing that they come in your time. Hear us as we pray. With confidence, let us boldly approach the throne as we stand and sing the prayer that Jesus taught us. We've offered our prayers. Now let us offer our gifts as our ushers come forward to collect the offering. <coughs>
Almighty God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Take what we are able to offer you this morning and use it to further the life and mission of this church in service to our community and the world. We pray this through Christ and in his name. Amen. Amen. join me in the prayer of the day. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, that we may become instruments of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. May the light of Christ surround you. May the love of Abba God enfold you. May the power of Holy Spirit protect you. And may the presence of God watch over you. And remember, wherever you are, God is and all will be well. Go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. Give you peace, and give you peace, the Lord.